Good morning. Grace and peace to you this fine morning. It is a beautiful morning. It's a little chilly, but we'll take it. It's not snowing yet, but it's a beautiful morning. I uh, just want to draw your attention to a few of the announcements on the back. We have our Harvest Home Food Drive table set up. If you would like to make a donation, please do so. Uh, we're taking them through uh, Harvest Home Sunday, which is November 24th. Also, we have coming up on Wednesday night, our fourth quarter staff parish relations committee meeting, seven o'clock hosted here at the church. And this is when we will be discussing the pastoral appointment letter that the pastor sends in and that the SPRC sends in. So you'll want to, if you have any input you would like to offer to Paula, to Rosanna, to Kathy, uh, that they could bring to the meeting regarding whether or not you wanna keep your pastor or get a new one. And they need to bring a missional reason why. Uh, that would be very helpful for them. So if you'd like to speak with them, please do. Also, next Sunday, uh, Brian and I will be recovering from Evan's wedding. Uh, so we have Edie Herzog coming to fill the pulpit next Sunday. So she's already quite excited about her message. I hope that you will be here. We have coming up on then the following Tuesday on October 29th, our church conference, which will begin promptly at 6.30, hosted at Faith in Spring Mills. If you have not yet signed up for a conference packet, but you know that you'll be attending, please do. We just are trying to get a pretty good, accurate count of how many we need to have available. And uh, if you received the email that I sent out yesterday about today's service, you will receive that packet by email. If you did not get an email from me and would like to get the packet, just let me know and, and get me that email address. Um, but full members of the church have full voting privileges. Anyone may attend full members are able and eligible to vote. Uh, but we do vote on all of the reports and all of those officers and things that are coming up for the next uh, year, for 2025. We also have Soup Kitchen scheduled for October 30th. If you would like to find out how you could be helpful to that ministry, just speak with Paula. She'd be happy to let you know. On All Saints Sunday, when I return November 3rd, I encourage you and invite you, if you would like, to bring a memento, a picture, something that... Um, is in honor of a saint who has gone before that, that really you're thinking about that day, you are welcome to place them on the rail, you're welcome to uh, hold them in your hand, um, but you're welcome to do that just as a way of encouraging you during that special service. We will also have Holy Communion that day. Um, and we have a lot of other events down there. You'll see those. Uh, if, if there are, any, are, are there any other announcements before we continue? Than seeing none. I do want to draw your attention to our centering words for this morning because we're starting a new discipleship series this week that's going to carry us through Harvest Home. And this really speaks to the why. What does it mean to actually carry your cross? Sometimes, like James and John, we have the wrong idea of what it means to follow Jesus. 
Would you please rise in uh, body or spirit as we prepare our hearts for worship by singing together the sanctuary song. Join me now in the call to worship. As the rains pour from heaven, soaking the earth that it may produce good things. So God poured God's love upon us, that we too may produce goodness and peace. We have been blessed with many gifts and talents. Let us worship and celebrate the mighty love and power of God. Thanks be to God, who has blessed us in so many ways. Continuing now with the opening prayer. Lord, everywhere we look, we see the imprint of your creative love. The wondrous works of nature show your majesty. As we gather today to celebrate your love and creation, Keep us mindful that we are part of that created order, meant to be stewards and not destroyers. Prepare us to work for you in ministries of peace and justice. Amen. Would you please turn in the hymnal to number 432 to sing, Yesu, Yesu, fill us with your love. This is 
service and love we bring out of our hearts the offerings and gifts that we bring back to God and to God's church to be multiplied and blessed and utilized as God sees fit. We want to prepare to bless those gifts by first singing together the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Loving God, you teach us humility and service, and so we bring our offerings today with grateful hearts. As we reflect today on your holy scriptures, may we give as a testament to our commitment to serve others, not seeking the highest places, but embracing the path of sacrificial love and discipleship. Bless these gifts and use them to advance your kingdom. Remind us that true greatness always comes through serving. It is in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. Um, there are many things that we do hold in confidence, the things that we just don't feel that we have agency to share out loud, but we can share them in silence of prayer, whether they be a joy or a sorrow. And so we're going to go to God with those concerns first, and then we will all pray together. <coughs> Loving and eternal God, there are things each one of us carries that you know full well. We come before you today with hearts full of gratitude for your grace and your mercy. You called us to follow your son, Jesus, to pick up our cross and walk. One step in front of the other, one foot in front of the other, on that pathway of discipleship. Yet we acknowledge that we often stumble and lose our way, just as those first disciples did, becoming distracted by the cares of this world so deeply embedded in us. Forgive us, Lord, in those times when we seek our own glory instead of yours, and remind us daily that true greatness is found in serving others just as Jesus served, even in the most difficult and challenging of situations. We lift today those who are carrying heavy crosses, the sick, the grieving, the lonely, and the oppressed, the hopeless. Strengthen them in their suffering, and may they find comfort in the knowledge that Jesus walks with them. We also pray for our church, that we may be a community of service, humility, having love for others, reflecting the heart of Christ in everything we do. We pray that you would guide our leaders in this time, both in the church and in the world, that they may seek justice, peace, and the common good. And as we continue on our own individual journeys of faith, give us the grace to stay focused on you, trusting in your sovereign will, seeking your kingdom above all else. You do call your disciples to be people of prayer, so let us share the words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, 
forever. Amen. Now that we have reconciled with God, let us reconcile with one another by rising and passing the peace of Christ in any way that is comfortable for you. Okay, as we make our way back to our seats, we're going to prepare to hear the word and the word proclaimed by remaining seated for our hymn of preparation. We're going to turn to number 362. We're going to sing together, Nothing But the Blood. We're going to begin our readings today in the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> this is Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Hearing about Jesus, the high priest, really the only one who could be the atonement for our sin. So hear these words. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided, since he himself also is beset with weakness. And because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins, as for the people, so also for himself. And no one takes the honor to himself, but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself, so as to become a high priest. But he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Just as he says also in another passage, You are a high priest forever. According to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard, because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him 
the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. In the second passage, we hear again from Job. And we hear, well, we actually we're going to hear from the book of Job, we're going to hear from God. But last week we heard Job crying out about how difficult it was for him to sense God's presence. It was difficult for him to see God. And we are so blessed because we know Jesus. God sent in flesh and blood. The word made flesh and bone. So hear the words of Job 38, verses 1 through 7 and 34 to 41. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you, and you instruct me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who sets its measurements, since you know, or who stretched the line on it? On what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that an abundance of water will cover you? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the innermost being or given understanding to the mind? Who can count the clouds by wisdom or tip the water jars of the heavens when the dust hardens into a mass and the clods stick together? Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens and lie in wait in their lair? Who prepares for the ravens its nourishment when its young cry to God and wander about without food? The next reading and final for today comes from the book of Mark. But before I go into this reading, I want to talk a little bit about this series of messages that we're going to be doing. Uh, we begin and end of year B. Yes, we have church years, A, B, and C. We are ending year B on Harvest Home Sunday, November 24th, because the first Sunday of the new year, which will be C, is always the first Sunday of Advent. And so during these weeks, we're going to be wrapping up the year with a series about discipleship, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, which it, you could also say what it means to follow Jesus. But before we dive into practical aspects of the pathway, we're going to pause and ask a critical question. Why would a disciple need to refocus? Doesn't just being a disciple mean you've already got it? Doesn't just being a disciple mean you've already signed up so you're good? Well, not necessarily. There is something called a pathway. This is the poster that you're going to have hanging up that you'll be able to see when you come in and, and as you leave church. And this discipleship pathway, they, there are these phases that you go through as a disciple. And you start out. I would dare say that there's actually one on the other side of the screen and one on this side of the screen. The one on the other side of the screen would be the seed that has been planted within us, all of us. Perhaps it's the prevenient grace that Wesley talks about, but there's something that's been knit together in us, a seed of faith that may lie dormant. We just don't see it, right? Just like a seed underground. You don't see the seed underground. You don't even see it being germinated. That's something that happens inside us. We see the sprout. So the sprout is the very beginning. The sprout grows into the sapling. The sapling grows into that growing disciple. By the time you're a growing disciple, you're really making Jesus the Lord of your life. You're really going to Jesus about things rather than relying on everything you've ever learned from the world about absolutely every tick and tittle of life. And then you're working on that and moving into that maturing disciple. I think a lot of us can think back to those maturing disciples that we knew that we'll think about on All Saints Sunday, whose faith was so strong they just were unwavering in it. It didn't matter how high the flood water was, they were not shaken. But they were stirred by Holy Spirit and encouraged by it. 
Now, the reason I wanted you to really have these kind of in the back of your mind is because I want, during these next several weeks, for each of you to be able to think about where am I really? Where am I in my pathway? Am I where I think I should be? And that's the thing. We're, we're probably never where we think we should be. We're just where we are. So it's good to just know where we are and go from there and don't worry about any of that other stuff. But it's so that you, between you and Jesus, we're not doing a chart, we're not signing anything, we're not writing anything down, but between you and Holy Spirit, where are you in truth on this pathway? And then what will it take to get you a step closer to Jesus? Making Jesus the center of it all. And then on Harvest Home Sunday, I'm going to actually give you a couple of resources where you can actually write down for yourself on your own time, not turning anything in, but you can put down where are you in these various aspects of your faith life? And then where are you in these other categories? What, what is the next step? What does it look like for you? So that you can decide when that new church year begins, you hit the ground running. It's a season of expectation. You will be able to set some expectations for yourself. And I think that's going to really deepen your appreciation for Advent. And I do want to mention that, you know, sometimes we do book studies or we do uh, all kinds of events that are for a specific one of those kinds of categories. But the Advent study, the book study we're doing by Zoom that's in your bulletin, it's for any one of them. It goes across the board. It doesn't matter where you are in your pathway. It's good for you to, to sign up for that. So I wanted to make sure you understood that, too. So we understand that there are these various uh, points. We become a hungry sprout at the point we accept Christ as our personal Savior, and that is begin accepting. It's not a one and done. We have to keep working at the fact that we're accepting Jesus to be our Lord and our teacher and our example. And it takes time because that's when you start to develop those new roots. You start to develop those roots that are going to lead to strong faith. Then we grow into the sprouts. Those sprouts in Christ become saplings that seek to grow and be shaped as disciples of Christ, continuing to learn what Christ means for them, for them personally in their life. In time, the sapling advances to, if they keep on going with it and don't get, become stagnant, they go into that uh, growing path, continuing to allow themselves to be pruned and trimmed. Say, so, you know what, I can't do these things this way anymore because I'm in Christ. And so in that growing time, we tend to uh, be just on the cusp and then we go into that maturing disciple. The maturing disciples have the ability to share the good news to all who will hear. They're an encourager and an, a guide to those just starting a relationship with Christ. But what you find too is the growing and maturing disciples tend to do a lot of things together. Not just in church, but outside of church. And they also are very willing to come along those sprouts and saplings and just be an encouragement, a positive encourager. And the reason I wanted you to understand all of this is I want you to hear Mark with an ear and a reminder of where do you see James and John? And where do you see Jesus? Jesus is our excellent example of maturing discipleship. How does he go about walking alongside maybe a sprout, maybe a sapling? So with that, we will go to our gospel reading from Mark chapter 10. Hearing verses 35 to 45. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus, saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant that we may sit on your right and one on your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? They said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you shall drink and you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. But to sit on my right or on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Hearing this, the other ten began to feel indignant with James and John, calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. 
But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The passage from Mark 10 brings us to this moment where James and John are on their pathway. They are curious. They are dreamers and thinkers. They have ideas. They have aspirations. And Jesus hears them with a welcoming ear, doesn't beat them over the head when they have questions. He loves questions, and he loves to give them truthful answers. Their ambition to be placed at the highest seat of honor reveals a very common human tendency to misunderstand the nature of discipleship. It is not membership. When we go to a gym and we buy a membership, what do we do? We purchase access to things. But we're not forced to use it. We aren't even necessarily directed in it. Every day may be leg day for you. You get to do with it what you want, right? You get to pick and choose what equipment you will use, when you will go, if you will go at all. You've paid your dues. You have your membership. Membership has, has its privileges. Discipleship is very different. Because it is not a membership. It's not a club. Whereas the club is something that you decide it's all about you, discipleship is all about Christ. And it's all about deciding what you will do according to what Christ is calling you to do. Discipleship is also different in that it is a process and it is a pathway. These are both action words. A process is something that is ongoing. And a pathway is something you must navigate. If you don't move one foot in front of the other, you get nowhere. So... Following is an action word. We think about following Jesus as another way of saying discipleship, but following, just like other words, can be hijacked by culture. You know how easy it is to follow people online, right? You just click a little button and boom, you're following. Kind of gives you a false sense of what following looks like, right? It's more like a membership. You have access to them. If they post something, you'll see it. But you get to decide whether or not you read it. You may ignore it. You may unfollow them at any time. Not really doing anything with that access is something that you choose. It's all about you. But discipleship process is an intentional method created to help you grow closer to the full likeness of Christ. It's actually getting closer and closer to Christ in all these different aspects of our life. This will make more sense whenever you see this wonderful little image that I'm going to give you on November 24th, but Jesus at the center. We're ever inching closer to Jesus at the center. Now Jesus said to them about their question, you do not know what you are asking, and it's true. We hear that understanding what happens at the cross. They want to be on his right and left when he goes to his glory. Who was on his right and his left when he was glorified at the cross? those for whom it was prepared, two thieves, one who would repent and be with Jesus and another who would not. And this was for a purpose that God had intended. And there are a lot of people that do struggle with that. How could a thief who spent his life doing terrible things get to heaven? Jesus we like to think it's because of the things we do that get us there. And so he says, you really, you don't know what you're asking, and it's true, but he doesn't tell them they're wrong. He just says they don't know what they're asking. And then he doesn't give them a hard time because he knows this is an important conversation, and he's going to make this conversation something worth remembering in time because in time they're going to know who that place was for. And so later, when they have that context of what Jesus meant by they don't know what they're asking, 
how would their willingness to believe that they are able, remember he said, are you able to drink the cup I drink, to be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? They said, we are able. Now we like to think, well, now, but they're willing to think that they are. So how would their willingness to believe they are able have helped them press on from the point they understood where the, who was on the right and who was on the left? I think it would have been a time for them to say, wow, Jesus was really good to us. He didn't say, no, man, you really don't want to do this. He said, that is not my place. It was not Jesus who said, you can't do this. It was God saying, this is something I need other people to be doing. I mean, who would have imagined that the thing that they asked for, which they believed was powerful and a, and a status symbol, was actually reserved for thieves for a purpose? They never would have imagined. When they thought about Jesus' words, you do not know what you are asking, later on, did they compare and contrast what they thought they were asking to what actually came to pass? The suffering Jesus knew that day he would endure because he talked about the cross often. He talked about picking it up and carrying your cross. They had not yet seen him carry his cross. But Jesus did not condemn them for their eagerness. Rather, he tries to refocus all of that energy toward the true cost of discipleship. And that's the kind of grace Jesus shows. That's the kind of grace I think all of us needs on our own discipleship pathway because we all take our eyes off the cross. The grace to be corrected, refocused, and realigned with Jesus' way rather than our own, or the way that the world demands that we love, or demands that we exercise our faith. That's grace we all need if we're going to get ourselves out of our own way. C.S. Lewis wrote, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. This is something James and John needed to master. I dare say not James and John alone. I think all of us struggle in this area too. John Wesley emphasized true discipleship involves a constant active pursuit of holiness and love. Because we're never really there. We don't reach it till we get to this side of the screen, the church eternal. Wesley preached the gospel of Christ knows <clears throat> of no religion <clears throat> but social, no holiness but social holiness. So in other words, discipleship is not about our individual gain. What we can get from Jesus, but what we can, with Jesus' help, attain for Jesus. And usually that benefits other people. It's about being in community together, serving others, and reflecting God's love to the world. When our new bishop spoke on Tuesday, I was very happy to hear about his insight on the community that we're intended to build, this real-life, messy community, because life is messy. You can dress it up. It's messy. I mean, how many of us are going to go home, and, and then we're going to put on our other Sunday clothes? <laughs> Sweatpants and T-shirts or sweatshirts, whatever. Life is messy. We are a community that needs to walk toward issues, not run them over or run people over, rather than hide from issues with the understanding we should never unite around a crisis because we've seen what happens when people unite around a crisis. Masks, vaccines. When people unite around a crisis, they're divided. Amen? When people unite around Christ, this is where you begin. When you're tuned to Christ, everything else will work itself out as long as you keep making Christ the center, the head. We must unite around Christ, tuning to his way, truth, and life in order to make a way for revival, to make that possible. So as we begin this Discipleship Pathway series and as you come in and as you leave and you see those different 
places where you could be, you can kind of start to explore where you might be or where you'd like to be. As we move through these last few weeks of the church year, we're going to prepare to prepare in Advent by getting real with Jesus. And by the time we hear the message with hands to the plow on Harvest Home Sunday, we're going to have a firmer footing on where we are and where we're headed and maybe have a couple of ideas on what we can do to get to that next step so that we will have, during that new season of expectation, a heart for Jesus that wants to grow closer to him. And in doing so, deepen our understanding of what it means to be his disciples and to guide us where we take our next faithful steps. In preparation for that, let's close the message with prayer. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the example of your son, Christ, who shows us the true meaning of discipleship through his humility, service, and love. Today we recognize that like James and John, we sometimes lose focus, and we misunderstand the purpose of that path you call us to walk. It is to do away with the distractions that would take our eyes off you. But in your mercy, you always give us grace to throw off those attachments that steal our focus so that we may follow you more faithfully. As we embark on this new discipleship pathway, we ask that you guide us, reveal where we are on our journey, and lead us in the next faithful steps. May your spirit encourage each one of us with the assurance you are with us, offering grace every step. Help us walk humbly, to serve others genuinely, to follow you closely, knowing that our journey is ultimately about becoming more like Jesus, which means we're going to go to places, we're going to deal with people, we're going to have to do things that are uncomfortable. It's in Christ's holy and precious name that we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. In the interest of time, we're going to sing the first and last verses only of our closing hymn. Please rise and body your spirit as you are able and turn to number 530 to sing the first and last verse of Are Ye Able, said the Master. sing verses 1 and 2 instead. 1 and 2. Are ye able, said the Master, to be crucified with me? Yea, the sturdy dreamers answered to the death Go now and be encouraged 
knowing that no matter where you are on the discipleship path, God's grace is ever present, calling us to keep our hands and hearts aligned with Jesus. Go now and know that God goes with you. Amen.